Everybody can get comfortable now. But um, if you feel so moved during the sermon uh, or scripture or whatever to get up and visit prayer stations, please know that that's okay. So we are in our second week of a sermon series called Embodied Epiphany, where we're talking about concepts around the body of Christ and discipleship. So last week, we talked about how God became embodied in Jesus. And this week, we're going to talk about how uh, it's called embodying our calling, about how each and every one of you is called to a unique thing in your life, some type of ministry to do. And in a couple weeks when we gather back together, um, we're going to be talking about the concept of the body of Christ, like the gathered community, and what it means to transform the body of Christ or to transform the world through the body of Christ. And then the week after that, which is Transfiguration Sunday, we're going to talk about what it would mean to transfigure the body of Christ. Interesting stuff. So um, this week our sermon is called Embodying Our Calling, and both of the scripture lessons, lectionary based, that we're going to hear for this week, it's two different stories about calling. One of them is from the Old Testament. There was a very young man, a teenager, named Samuel, who was called by God, and he becomes the first prophet that rises right before the kings. And then our second Old Testament, or second lesson is actually a gospel lesson, and it's still in the first chapter of Mark, like we were last week. It's Jesus calling some of the disciples to follow him. So we're gonna listen to both of those right now. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was laying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus called to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went a little further. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. Two very different stories about calling. 
In the story of Samuel, I like how it starts with uh, the word of the Lord was, was rare in those days. Some mornings it feels like that. Some weeks it feels like that. And uh, we have this young boy who doesn't even know God, and yet God calls to him, which is fascinating. And then we have uh, the New Testament gospel lesson where we hear that this radical who has been baptizing people in the River Jordan has now been arrested, and that Jesus has taken over this ministry fully. And when he walks up to people and says, come follow me, they drop their nets and go immediately. But both of these are calling stories, stories about being called by God. So what does it mean to be called by God? This is a very good question. Um, Calling is one of these words that Christians just kind of like throw around. I don't know, I feel like we hear Oprah say it a lot too these days. It's like, find what you love and then figure out how to do it for a living, right? We kind of live in a a time period where that's a normal thing, where we talk about kind of finding your passion and then figuring out how to do it in the world. And, and, and that's kind of what we talk about when we talk about calling in the Christian church. Um, but it actually goes deeper than that. We can be talking about your vocation. We can be talking about what you do to make a wage. Or if your vocation is to be raising a family, you brave, brave souls. I had two kids under the age of three. So you brave, brave souls who do that as your calling. But we're talking about something deeper because because if we're following the call that God has put in our lives, we are always working for the kingdom of God and the reign of Christ in the world. So it's, it's not just about some like passion that you have. Though it's not to, that passion, those passions are not to be ignored either. This is not a dichotomy. All of it will kind of speak in to who you are and who you are meant to be in God. In fact, one of the ways that we, we talk about this in the Christian church, we have a term called the ministry of all believers. Has anyone ever heard this term? Yes, it's always good when at least a couple people know it because it's something Methodists believe in, <laughs> and here we all are. So it's called the ministry of all believers. We actually believe that each and every one of you in this room are ministers and are called to ministry. Ministers. I do not mean ordained clergy people standing up and preaching in front of everyone on Sundays. In fact, I probably wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Uh, it's, not, it's not always the easiest job, right? But, but everyone is called to be a minister of something. There's something in your life that you do to help usher in the kingdom of God to help people remember what's really important and what's at the core of who we are as a people and what we are about. And when we talk about your calling, that is what we're talking about. Maybe it is to help out with the kids. If this church, maybe it's to play music, whether that's in a music program at your church or in the band that you play with on Friday night because you know it brings people joy. Maybe it's art. Poetry, painting, sculpting. Maybe you're that friend that just listens really, really, really well. Maybe you have that gift where you walk in the room and you can read people and, and find the one that needs a hug, right? Maybe you use your hands and you can build houses and plant trees, fix my leaky pipes under my sink. <laughs> We're looking for a plumber, by the way. Um, <laughs> whatever your calling is, right? Maybe it's to teach Sunday school. Maybe it's to, to be with your families all of the time and more present than I'm able to be with mine. Whatever it is, it's the thing that brings about the kingdom of God in the world. And when we, when we baptize um, children or, or adults or whatever, when we baptize people and we have that wonderful, tangible ritual, one of the things we're acknowledging is that God has called you as an individual, that you indeed have something to do in this world. Um, We aren't to use our gifts and our passions just because they make us feel good or because we're good at them. If we're not using our gifts, our talents, our life, 
for God and for bringing about the reign of God in this world, there will be an emptiness in us. It just ends up being shallow. It just doesn't feel like a full life. It's almost as if these bodies have to figure out together how to embody the Spirit of God together. We have to figure out how to come back into our own flesh and live into it. Last week I talked about us being a culture that likes to talk about ideas instead of living them. How we, I say we, I mean me, whenever I do that, just so you know, okay. How we like to sit at coffee shops discussing ways to help the world instead of going out and actually doing it. And this is a sign of disembodiment in our faith as well. That we have these ideas about helping others, but that we haven't yet figured out how to bring that into our skin. Or to even acknowledge it maybe in the larger body of Christ around us. I have sometimes been the kind of person who comes to church and allows my spirit to be filled and nurtured. And I experience that. And yet like I go out into the world and often my flesh does not respond. Like my heart was touched by the message and the music and the communion. But then like as soon as I walk out of the building, part of my identity was left in the building and the rest of me goes outside. And I'm really confused about how that disembodiment happens and why it works like that. And I think part of the reason it was like that for me for so many years is because I didn't understand that I was being called. And when I say that I was being called, I don't mean the part of me that showed up to church on Sunday morning and got touched by the music and the message. I'm talking about the part of me that went and was a bartender slinging drinks on Thursday night. I I couldn't imagine that God wanted to use that part of my life. That perhaps people that came and sat down in those restaurants to whom I served a whiskey drink might have needed someone to hear their story. Maybe they needed someone to love them really well. Maybe they needed the reflection of Jesus Christ in the world right in that moment. Maybe even more than I needed it on Sunday morning. I was confused about my calling because I assumed God would only call part of me and not all of me. And that's where we got it mixed up. That's where it's twisted. Jesus didn't go up to a group of fishermen and say, cast down your nets, throw them to the side, go take three years of classes, go through ordination, and then come follow me. That is not how that worked. It's you. It's, it's you, it's all of who you are that God calls. I didn't realize God was calling me and this is one of the reasons I love the story of the call of Samuel so much. Samuel, he, just a little backstory. His mother Hannah could not get pregnant. She was barren and she kind of like had this conversation with God that said, if you give me a child, I will give that child back to you to serve you forever. So when she birthed Hannah, she kept him till, she, till uh, she nursed him And as soon as she weaned him from nursing, she brought him to this temple where Eli worked, where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. And so he was raised under Eli. And in the story we heard, he's actually sleeping near the Ark of the Covenant, which is a whole different sermon in itself. It's very strange. And he hears someone call his name. And seeing that Eli, who he he works for, who's raised him, is blind, he thinks, oh, Eli needs something, right? So he goes to Eli, he's like, what? you called my name. And he was like, I didn't call your name. Go back to bed. I'm tired. You know, and Samuel hears his name called again. And he goes to Eli and says, I heard you call my name. What do you need? I'm here to serve you. And you got to imagine at this point, Eli's tired of getting woken up, you know, and he's like, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. And the third time it happens, Eli's finally like realizes what's happening. And he's like, oh, that's not me. That's God. So stop waking me up. Number one. And two, next time you hear the voice, tell God you're listening. Samuel didn't realize that the thing that was calling him, that was tugging on him, was coming from God. And I relate to that. I often think we're told that particular parts of ourselves just couldn't possibly be the thing that are being pulled in to Christ's kingdom to help change this world. 
Whoever that is, I love your ringtone. It's okay. Nothing but grace here. I also enjoy the story of Samuel because God calls children too. And anytime, anytime the scriptures acknowledge that, that teenagers are called, you know how many teenagers are called to do work for God in the Bible? It's all over the place. My goodness, if we cannot figure out how to listen to our young people more, it is so important. God calls children. God calls teenagers. I love that part. I was confused about my calling when I was younger because I was convinced that there were parts of myself that God simply didn't want. Last week, we talked about how the Spirit of God came upon Jesus' body. And as Christians now, we believe that the Spirit of God is present throughout the body of Christ. That the Spirit of God comes and does work in the world. Okay? The Spirit of God is the one creating and redeeming the world and reconciling in the world. But how we, we talked about how the Spirit, though it does this work, it's always connected to the tangible, to, to water, to the communion elements, to your flesh and your bodies, to real life things. So when I say your calling is gonna take you outside of the walls of this church and also inside of the walls of this church. I'm talking about that work of reconciliation, creation, and redemption being done through you. Through you. That the Spirit of God is present here among us in order for us to go back out into the world in a responsive way. It might not always feel like that though, right? Like, I, I can be spiritual at church, but I can't dare be spiritual in these other spheres or areas of my life. That's dangerous, Pastor Winter. Yeah, it is. Being part of the kingdom of God is not easy. Figuring out how to be Jesus-like people out in the world when you cannot stand your coworkers or when you are struggling with your loved ones or, God forbid, you're in traffic is not easy, right? But this is, again, what it means to be called. And I... As I was putting this, this sermon together, I, I had this thing that kept coming up, and I don't know why it keeps coming up, but I, I was convicted to say so. I wanted to know if you feel like God is calling you. Like, I want you to ask yourself that right now. Do you feel like God is calling you? Do you understand that you're a minister? Have you, have you figured that out yet? Is it possible that that's already started and you just didn't realize it was something that was coming from God? Is there like a part of you that's been able to be really like compassionate and good and make for goodness in the world that's already happening in your life but nobody yet told you that that was from God and that you're doing God's work? If that is the space you're in right now, this is the moment where you get to hear it. <laughs> that that is the work of God that is your calling, and that's what you're here to do. I am a person who had such a painful and difficult time in church, in a Christian religious setting. The very last place that I learned to live into my call was, was within the walls of a church building. Do you see what happens to people like me? The very last place. So if that idea of calling and ministry is not yet, quite yet comfortable within the walls of a church, that's okay too. And you need to hear that. And that doesn't make you less a part of this body as well. There is a chance that God has been using you out in the world and in other spaces. But there's also something about the fact that we gather here together on Sunday mornings that when you become a member here or when you get baptized here, you make certain promises. The idea is that we're supposed to figure out also how to live into these calling of all, callings of ours together here at a church, which is not an easy task. All right, we're talking about you figuring out how to be involved and do something perhaps more than to just come to worship on Sunday morning. I'm not saying, <laughs> that's, that might be a threatening statement. 
I'm not trying to say I'm gonna like force anybody to do that, but I'm asking you to consider the idea that part of being called to being a member of this church or being someone who worships here is to maybe do something else as well. Even if it's just pray. Even if you're someone who just prays for this church. Pray for it every day. When we follow the call that God gives us, we're always working for the kingdom of God and the reign of Christ in the world. And so part of being the body of Christ together is to not only remember how we are to embody this faith and this calling as individuals and seek it out into the world, but also as a community here together in a church. And, and part of that is, I think, a good first step is to just acknowledge that like right here in this present moment, the spirit of God is alive and active moving between all of us. It's interesting that God can call all of these different kinds of people together in this room. The more I get to know people as individuals in this congregation, the more I'm amazed at how different everybody is. And yet God calls all of these different people. Jesus' choice to walk up to a group of fisher folk and to say, drop your nets and follow me this is fascinating. The idea that, that God calls people that you just wouldn't expect to come together and to become part of community is so fascinating to me. And that, you know, Jesus didn't say like, come and just, you know, listen to the words I say passively through this preacher or through scripture or through music. He said like, come follow me, like come do something. Like there's a task, there's something that we're able to do. I like that. I like that we're asked to embody it. I'm, I like that we're asked to embody it together. That we are asked to stop and like when we pray, to feel the spirit close. When we are making a meal for our friend that is under the weather, that you stop and you smell the spices. And how holy that is. Or like midday when you're dealing with your children running around and then as stressful as it might get, you hear that laughter for one second and you come back into your body and you remember how holy it is again. And how, how as connected as we are as individuals to these moments, how we're also called to have those types of things communally. Embodied faith and embodied calling using this term body for us as a community. This is powerful stuff. It again acknowledges that we belong to each other and that the health of one of us affects the health of the rest of us. And that if you're a person who doesn't feel loved or known by God right now, that there's probably a part of each of us inside that's feeling that as well. So it's our job as a church, it's our calling as a church to lift each other up, to figure out how to make the ministries of this place run smoothly and how to be here for each other in that. So, you might be sitting there thinking, okay, where do I begin? Pastor Winter says, I'm called towards something. I have absolutely no idea what I should be doing with my time if I choose to give my time. Well, we're not leaving you empty-handed today. So our uh, has everyone heard or yet met Jim Pike, our new director of faith formation? He used to go to this church also. He's amazing, all right? Stamps of approval all around. Absolutely amazing. He has um, gathered some resources for our congregation. So the, there's like an online assessment you can take that will help you discern and understand what your spiritual gifts are. Basically, you take a survey and you can learn words about who you are. You know, like how we do for other things like Myers-Briggs and stuff. It'll help you kind of discern your spiritual gifts. There's an online version. It's like our website backslash spiritual gifts. Okay, we're gonna try to make the website like have a bigger button on it probably starting tomorrow or the next day as well. So you can go online and you can learn more about your individual spiritual gifts. If you're like, I don't want my stuff in the ether, Big Brother is watching or whatever, we also have hard copies. I'm in that second category almost all the time. 
Um, we have hard copies out at the Faith Formation table on the other side of this wall. There's also computers out there if you want to do the online version right there. So if you want to begin to think deeper about your calling, and maybe you don't know where to begin, the spiritual gifts assessment is certainly one way, one way to do that. All right, so my last point, this is it, in my long rambling sermon on calling. I want you to remember that this entire world, this entire world, and all of God's creation, since the very beginning, was named and claimed as good. Okay, that the world was named and claimed as good. God made it, God said it was good, so you are good. Or as I say to myself on my really difficult days, Winter, you are good enough. You are good enough and God is so great that just being good enough means God can make great things happen. You are all good enough to make great things happen in this world and in this church. You can be used by God you can live into your calling and embody your calling. We can embody our calling. Sometimes it just helps to come back to the present moment and recognize that the holy is all around you, y'all. Whether that's at a church space or somewhere else. To recognize that we are part of the spiritual kingdom. The spiritual kingdom of God that is completely and directly connected to the tangible here on earth. It is always connected and embodied in the tangible. And you are part of this. You are all part of this, the ministry of all believers. Each of you are part of the kingdom of God. So bear witness to it and respond to it. Discipleship is not about tasks. It's not. It's not about tasks. It's about identity. It's about what voice you want to hear in the world. It's about what identity you choose to live into. I know who you belong to. You belong to God. God has named you and claimed you and called you good and is going to use you to fill out God's purposes in the world. Amen.